Hey everybody, this is Bruce and the Dog on the Floor, and today we're here to talk to you about multiple dispatch. Many have called it the defining feature of the language, including the creators of the language, and I hope you like the videos that we showed from them. So here's what we're talking about. A lot of languages allow you to have this, this function that's a custom function called combine or something like it, where we want to tailor our implementation based on the type of X. In Elixir, this is called a protocol. In Java, this is called an interface. And here's what it looks like. So the idea is that X could have some type. And we may have one implementation based on a type of X of string and another implementation based on the type of X as a number. And in object-oriented programming, you would do this with inheritance and polymorphism based on inheritance. But there's a problem here. There's actually a fly in the ointment. Maybe we want multiple implementations based on either attribute. So maybe that maybe we want a string and a number, and, and we want to support different versions of, of implementations based on both of these arguments. Well, these two arguments is where the multiple comes from in multiple dispatch. So we can build in Julia an implementation that says, hey, both of these are strings, or hey, both of these are numbers, or even these two are different types, like a number and a string or a string and a number. And the implementation is so readily accessible that it has a tremendous impact on Julia programs and if you think about a plug in a socket, this actually enables tremendous reuse, both from the plug end and the socket end. I wanna show you a couple of programs based on this idea that show the interesting ways that these ideas can be combined. All right, it's time to let this fly. So we're going to write a function called combine. And if I pass it, for example, a six and a seven, it should return something like a 13. And if I pass it like a, a six and a seven, it should return something like a six, seven. And if I return a six and a seven, it should pick up this type, convert this to a string and return a six, seven, and so on and so forth. And along the way, we're going to show you how leaving the type definitions off when you're not doing dispatch will actually pay some dividends for us a little bit later. So we're gonna talk about that as well. So let's get started with our first dispatch function. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna say combine, I think I've got this right, X is a string and a Y is a string equals what x y this is remember the dollar is the interpolation so I'm gonna say combine combine hello world and yeah so it's it's um, tying these together and if I want to do if these are numbers plus y. If these are numbers, I'm going to make this as generic as possible. Right? So this is going to allow me to combine so for example of uh, 41 and 1 to give me the ultimate answer to everything, 42 but it will also allow me to take advantage of the more exotic uh, number types, right? Because we've used plus and plus was defined generically over number and it's using a multiple dispatch to build implementations of the various types here. For example, if we want to use imaginary numbers, we could do something like combine, uh, for example, uh, 41 I am plus one and a two that, that should be 41 I am let's do 40 
40 there just to give us at least 142 in there. How about 242s? Yeah. So this is effectively 42i plus plus 42. Or if I wanted to do, for example, uh, a rational number like 5 sixths, I could do it this way. Or if even if I wanted to do floats, I could do it that way. So you can see that I'm getting a lot of flexibility because I, I've built my combine to be generic with the use of plus, and I've left it to the Julia developers to provide the implementation underneath. Okay, so now we have implementations with string string and with number number. Let's kick it up a notch and mix these types. All right, so let's take a look at how we would combine another. So let's combine Let's say if x is a string and y is a um, number, I would do something that looks like this. Um, maybe I'll just use interpolation again. And then um, that's x. I could probably have been more generic with the last one. And then I could say combine 40 with 2 like that. And that gives me 42. And I picked up the, the type of that first argument. And if I want to do the, the last one, um, I have to be a bit more specific and less generic. But that's OK, um, because, uh, because Julia's multiple dispatch is going to let me carve out all the uh, different implementations with number that I use. So if I do something like this, um, where x is the number and y is the string, I could do, for example, parse, let's see, is that like an int? Is that what it is? Int, so we're parsing the number, right? So we want a number back. So we want x plus parse int and y. That's right. OK, so then we could say something like combine where 2 is the string and 4 and this will prefer the first argument that looks like that. Yeah, so we've, we've actually done a different kind of combination there, and, um, and it works great. Um, so actually, just to keep our karma <laughs> intact with a, with a great number of 42, let's do it that way. So this is pretty cool. I've been able to use to make some pretty generic functions and take advantage of other existing functions. And I can go ahead and implement the other types anywhere that I have a parse. I can go ahead and implement the parse for the individual type of number that I'm working with. So it's probably better to, to scope this just to integers and not numbers, right? And or actually, number works great here, right? And, and um, I can scope this to, um, to any type of, of string that I want to be able to parse by I don't know, um, providing some brain power to the API. But for right now, what we've got is pretty good. It would be pretty interesting to be able to extend this also to arrays, and especially arrays of various types. And so that's what we're going to work on next. Let's say that I want to drop whatever second into that array, right? So maybe I want to do something like combine this array of 39, 40, 41, and I want to go ahead and add like a 42 to that array, just to kind of drop that in and, and have this notion of combine. So have that return like all these numbers plus 42 like that. So here's what I would do here. So this is if X is an array and I'm not going to specialize the generic type of the array. And the reason that I'm not is that I want to be able to take advantage of the implementation of the generic implementation underneath in the multiple dispatch in array. And so, and then I could put um, item, and this could be anything, right? So I can go ahead and do something like this. So I could say push. This is actually going to mutate the array in place. So I'm going to add to x, and I'm going to push the item. 
So what if I said combine 40, 41 with 42? Yeah, so that just popped it right in there. And that's pretty cool, right? So, but what we want to do if these are in the other order, right? So maybe the 42 is here. What I'd actually like to do is to maintain an integer. So maybe I want to add those two things up. So let's see how we might go about that. So is there a sum of one, two, three? Yeah, there is. So we could take advantage of this, which also has some multiple dispatch built in. You could see how we're multiplying the impact of this. And so if I have something like this, so if that's y, if y is the array and x is a number, y is the array, then I could do something like this. So I could say sum of y plus, or actually, we could say um, x plus the sum of y, right? Okay, and so let's see how this works. So uh, let's say combine the array of, uh, let's see, so 39, 39, and then I have an array of 1 and 2. That's going to give me 42. 39, 40, 42, right? So we can start to stack these things and, and multiply these things, and we can get reuse either on the plug end or the socket end. We can we could try to optimize performance with the work that we're doing. We could try to optimize the usability. And we don't have to have the initial code base of the thing that we're building on. So for example, we've taken advantage of the plus and we've added and, and we've we've added some um, we've taken advantage as a user of plus of the multiple dispatch there to get the exotic numbers added together with our, our combined function. We can also get some extra use as a library creator. So if we're creating a library creator, we could take advantage of the basic Julia types and then rely on our users to build extra implementations where they need to. And the thing that makes this work is if I'm doing a function like add, so one of the things that I could do is say x and this could be a float 64 and a Y. So I could type these things all the way down um, to the bottom if I wanted to, but it's better to go ahead and be generic as possible at the top of the food chain, right? So now I am taking advantage of anything that implements the plus function and um, I'm getting use of multiple dispatch underneath without doing the work to implement those, those pieces of code myself. So what happens is that Julia's ecosystem has a much higher level of reuse than the object-oriented systems out there. So for example, you might have an object-oriented class that can only implement single dispatch based on multiple inheritance, right? or based on, based on inheritance, it, not necessarily multiple inheritance, but that means that I get one shot for designing where the extension is going to happen within my application. So I really love this idea of multiple dispatch. It's so sweet and easy to implement with single line functions as I need to extend things. And that's really an excellent thing. So this is Bruce and the dog on the floor for Groxio Learning.